You know, truly, it has been a wonderful week of study, hasn't it? That our Heavenly Father has blessed us with so many opportunities to gather together with brothers and sisters from across the globe. You know, truly, it's a blessing of the age that we've been able to focus our minds in these last days on the beauty of God's kingdom. You know, as we witness all the signs around us, we know that soon the Lord Jesus Christ will come in glory to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. And our thoughts for this afternoon's devotion are on that very subject, God's kingdom. You know, as Brother Luke mentioned in his prayer, specifically looking forward to that time when the whole earth will be filled with his glory. And we just want to take a few moments now before our midday prayer to really look at how we ought to approach this subject and not just approach it in our prayer life, but also in everyday life when we put our prayers into action. So let's just read from our theme verse in Psalm 72. And we're just going to start in verse 18 for some context. The psalmist writes, Blessed be Yahweh God, The God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And so just like that, David The psalmist there in Psalm 72 closes the second book of the Psalms. And, you know, just like the closing doxologies of Psalm 41, the first book of the Psalms, Psalm 89, the third book of the Psalms, and Psalm 106, the fourth book of the Psalms, the psalmist brings the mind of the reader to a higher level. In these final words of prayer, he focuses on God. He focuses on Yahweh, he who will be. He focuses on the God of Israel. He focuses on a God whose reign is everlasting and eternal and whose glory will soon fill the earth. That's the psalmist's focus as he closes off his entirety of thought in this section. The psalmist in a prayer looks forward to a day when the whole earth will be filled with God's glory. Amen and amen. And as you well know, you've probably looked at some of these verses already this week. But that's not the only time this theme of the earth being filled with God's glory comes up in scriptures, is it? In fact, we have this little beautiful thread that we can follow throughout scriptures to really help us understand what this means when we pray for it. Because we want to pray with understanding whenever we offer prayer to the Heavenly Father. And well, one of the first ones, one of the most notable ones is back in Numbers 14, verse 21. And you don't have to turn any of these up if you don't want. I know you all know them. But Numbers 14, verse 21, God says, But truly I live. It's emphatic. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh. You know, perhaps when you were younger, you didn't quite understand the context of that section. You knew that Numbers 13 was a chapter of rebellion, but when you get to Numbers 14, God gives this wonderful promise in a verse wherein he shares the hope of the end goal with his people in the same sentence when he rejects an entire nation. But that's when God painted the beautiful picture from the beginning, isn't it? That the earth would be filled with the glory of Yahweh. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Because in Isaiah chapter 11, Amidst some of those kingdom visions, we read, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh, as the waters cover the sea. And in a time of trial and persecution upon the nation, when very few of the prophets remained, God sent one of his chosen prophets and expanded on that goal that he had set in Numbers. Now knowledge is added to glory. And finally, in Habakkuk 2, verse 14, we read, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And finally, God takes it one step farther. It's knowledge of the glory of Yahweh. 
And it really drives home the point that if we want to give glory to God, our Heavenly Father, He who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and I, well, we have to have a knowledge of Him. And really, we know that the only way we can gain such knowledge is by reading His Word, by studying from it. If we don't do that, well, then there won't be anyone to fill the earth with God's glory. It requires individuals to come to a knowledge of God. And if we need a further clarification of this case, well, Paul puts it plainly in his letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he writes, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so Paul brings it full circle. And he shows us that it's through the perfect manifestation of God, seen in the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we, that you and I, can come to a knowledge of the glory of God. And so when the psalmist prayed for the earth to be full of God's glory, he was praying for a day when the whole world has shared in the redemptive work of Christ and come to a knowledge of the Almighty. That's what we're praying for when we end almost every single prayer with something along the lines of praying for the earth to be filled with God's glory, that's what we're praying for. And note that the psalmist looks forward to a day when the earth is filled with his glory. You know, in that soon coming day, there will be no room for anything else. If it does not glorify God, it won't be there. That's what we're praying for. You know, it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? It's truly a day worth praying for when the earth will be filled with God's glory. Amen and amen. But as we know with all prayers, we must be ready and willing to act when we pray. When we offer up a prayer to God, we must be ready to be a vessel fit for use in the fulfillment of that prayer. And so how can we endeavor in our daily lives to work towards the fulfillment of this prayer, that the earth will be filled with his glory, so that our prayer might not just be vain words? Well, we can take two paths, really, can't we? We can follow the advice of Paul and share with others the gospel message, as seen in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can preach to those around us the hope of the gospel, the hope of Israel, and all that it entails. And by such, we can bring others to a knowledge of the glory of God. We can work towards that purpose, both in prayer and in our lives. But you know, sometimes that isn't possible, is it? It's not always possible to share such a grand conversation with everyone we meet. And in times like that, we can follow the example of our Heavenly Father, who when Moses asked to see the glory of God, he was shown the character of the Almighty. Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty. As Yahweh passed by the cleft of that rock, Moses was intimately shown the glory of God, even his character. You know, when Moses came down from that mount, his face shone with that glory. It was a glory seen in perfect character for all to behold. And so brothers and sisters and young people, as we leave this Bible school schedule, you know, it's been jam-packed with time spent around God's word. As we return to our normal daily schedules, whatever that new normal might be, let's not let this excitement that we have within us fade. You know, Brother Bob Lloyd, a dear brother who fell asleep some years ago, he called this spiritual excitement that he had after Bible school, the Bible school glow. And just like the glory of Moses' face, it was visible to all those around him. So let's take this fervor, this kingdom conference glow, and its brightness truly a testament to time spent in study together, 
in fellowship around God's word and share it with those around us. You know, if we truly pray that God's earth will be filled with his glory, If that is one of our greatest desires, then we ought to endeavor each and every day in all that we do to that end. And so, brothers and sisters, as we go forth this week, I encourage you to remember all that you have studied, all that you've discussed, especially these wonderful midday meditations on prayer, and seek to apply them in your lives. You know, as we pray daily, Let us pray at evening, at morning, and noon, for a day so long for, when the kingdom of God will fill the earth. Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that holy city wherein God chose to put his name. Let's pray without ceasing, knowing that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's join the faithful saints of old as we pray, How long, O Lord? holy and true. And truly, we join our voices with the psalmist as we pray with deepest yearning for the day when God will be manifested upon the earth. Blessed be Yahweh God, the God of Israel who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen.